Today's reading is taken from Genesis, chapter 18, verses 16 to 33. Abraham pleads for Sodom. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous from the wicked? Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Lord, the Lord said, If I find fifty righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, although I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? If I find 45, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. Abraham said, Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only twenty can be found there? He said, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only ten? can be found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you're. Uh, how? Oh, I just wonder how you are, really. I hope you're well. Um, I hope this uh, sunshine is helping a little bit. Maybe you're able to get out into the garden or enjoy a little bit of a break, uh, just a break from the household uh, and whatever you're doing. And if you are able to, if you are working, you are having to go out, then uh, God's uh, grace and peace be upon you. Um, and, and thank you for all you're doing, uh, keeping our, our village and towns running. I wonder, I wonder how easy you are to find it, finding it to pray at the moment. It's, to be honest, it's very difficult. You sort of find yourself with all this time uh, and actually getting down to some praying um, seems to be quite a bit of a challenge. I wonder if, like me, you're a bit of a, uh, you can sort of wander off and find other things to do, uh, fill our time with all sorts of other stuff, or whether you're able to just sort of scatter lots of little prayers around as you go uh, and hope that they land somewhere. And I find that quite, it's quite a challenging time, as in it, at the moment. We need to be a, a different kind of church, a different kind of people, and perhaps we can grow and learn from that uh, as we go forward. So I was interested in this passage about Abraham and his journey uh, this week, which was from our, our regular set of readings that we were planning. 
And one of the things that we read about is his access uh, to God. Uh, God has appeared to Abraham on several occasions already. Uh, he's familiar, if you like, with his presence. And that's always something to practice, even if it's just sitting still and asking him to be with you uh, for 10 or 15 minutes a day. Uh, then that's a good thing. Uh, that's an encouraging thing to encourage uh, a life of the presence of God. Uh, but what we also see is that Abraham it is, is somebody who needs reassurance a bit. Uh, we see that God has come to Abraham and Sarah to reaffirm those promises that he's made to him uh, in order that his blessing, his promise of blessing will be fulfilled. And so we read that this child Isaac stands as this, this symbol, this person, uh, a promise of hope and joy in the future. And it's after this conversation uh, with Abraham and Sarah that these three visitors leave Abraham's tent as a good host um, he goes to see his guests on their way to so make sure they're setting off on the right path I suppose um, and as they walk they look towards Sodom and that's the first hint that we get of what is to come we see something of this relationship emerging within the frame of uh, what will happen or what God wants to do with Sodom and the first thing we sort of read is there's something here in what God is saying. The writer interprets or, or reads into what God will shortly reveal. Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? And this phrase uh, implies that God is prepared to reveal more of his purpose to Abraham. He's prepared to invite him into uh, that kind of world and life. And that's a wonderful thought. It's a reminder, isn't it, from uh, those early days, you know, that mankind was supposed to be a representative of God on earth. And, and so here he's invited back into that, that relationship for a moment there. They're walking together, perhaps in the eve of the day, as uh, Genesis tells us Adam and Eve had done. And it tells us uh, a bit more, in fact. Verse 19, uh, we hear the phrase, I have chosen him. He considers Abraham to be not just his creation, but his companion. He is, in fact, my friend. That word is used later, a sort of archetypal phrase of Moses, friend of God. And we hear that phrase of Abraham of two as well. And that's really encouraging for us, isn't it? Because in spite of the mistakes that we've seen in Abraham, his doubts, his fears, um, his, his ridicule sometimes, his lies, um, we find that God sees Abraham's faith as friendship, wants to draw him into this life, wants to do life uh, with him. And that thing about being his friend means that God is counting Abraham's sin to be dealt with. And we know that from Romans 3, that is something that we see. Um, but also uh, that he is going to bring in forgiveness and life as he stands in the world there and then. God takes Abraham's faith and friendship and lays out his own divine purposes. And that's a healthy reminder for us, isn't it? Jesus told his disciples, I have called you friends in a similar way. The faith in Jesus Christ's death for our sin and resurrection to new life uh, bring us into relationship with God as Father. So we don't pray aimlessly. We pray to a person who knows us and wants to know us uh, more, wants us to know him more. And that's one of the things that is coming out here as well. The phrase, I have chosen him, is then developed to say, uh, that God will instruct him and Abraham will instruct his children to learn God's ways. We all have a call to learn and discover what life with God is. And that's really hard if you don't talk to him about it. It's really interesting watching our, uh, my son uh, trying to learn from home with on, online without the opportunity to talk to the teacher about what, how to do this or how to approach this or would be this this be the right way. Can you imagine this? this can you imagine life without talking to God about how to do things? That's the sort of thing that he wants to instruct us in. And when we do, we, th we find things emerge. We find that things catch our attention, that we might pass something by. And so I wonder how important that is. Or I wonder who is praying. What's going on there? Things catch our attention. They become important. Or even sometimes 
uh, they become a burden until we have prayed to God about it. We have worked it out with him what he is going to do. And I wonder who or what is on your heart right now to pray for. Really important to bear those things in mind. Well, what's on God's heart right now is this outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a bit, it is very much like the Genesis story, like Abel's blood, the cry of sin uh, and evil has reached the Lord. And so he is going to see for himself. It's not that God is unaware. Uh, he's not going to send a drone. He's going to go and find out for himself. But he wants to show himself to Abraham to be just and fair. He does the same, actually, in chapter 6 before the flood and in chapter 11 before the destruction of Babel. He wants to see what's going on. So if you think God acts capriciously or willfully or randomly, we see here far from it. He will see for himself. He will look for evidence. He will examine the facts. In his commentary on this chapter, Gordon Wenham notes that the if not at the end of this conclusion gives a chink of hope. God is even open to the city's repentance. If not, I will know. So it's important sometimes to ally ourselves to God's causes. When we pray, when we intercede, we join in with what God is wanting to do, not him doing what we want to do. I said a few weeks ago that the Old Testament world was full of people telling their God what they wanted and then that was we, that would be what they hoped would happen. But we are allying ourselves with God, whose plan is to redeem and save mankind. This mm -hmm. blessing is going to be really important to us. God is holy. He's morally perfect. He is above all things. He is the only absolute truth that there is. So he is wholly just, always does the right thing, but can judge rightly. And so he is to be feared. For the local area, this part of the ancient Near East where Abraham lives, they'd removed this threatening eastern king, King Kedileum. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that twice, um, uh, by another like-minded man, the king of Sodom. There's this, there's this kind of this eastern king and his allies came to try and take it all for themselves. And Abraham rushed in and defended uh, and, and, and defeated these eastern kings. And in, in so doing, uh, rescued the king of Sodom's people and his treasure. But God has got his mind to get his set against Sodom. And there's lots of things going on. There's the, the We read about the violations in Genesis 19. That, that They're well known to us, I suppose. The church has made a lot of those. But we often need to read back a little bit as well. They're a symptom of something deeper, uh, not right. They weren't right with God in the first place. Look at Genesis 13, 13. And when Lot moves to that area, we read that the people were wicked and sinned greatly against God. And then in this battle, after this battle where Abraham has defeated this king who I can't pronounce, um, and he's defeated this king and he's rescued the king of Sodom's people and treasures that have been taken from him. Abraham is greeted by not just by the king of Sodom, but by Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is this ancient, mysterious priest. We don't really get a lot about him, except he's a really important character and he represents lots of important stuff. When Melchizedek comes to greet Abraham, he says he brings with him wine and bread and he brings a blessing from God. He's a priest of God. He brings good things for Abraham. He wants to honour him. King of Sodom turns up and says, give me my stuff back. In fact, I'm not even interested in the stuff. Give me the people. Well, why would a man like that want people? Well, to repopulate his city and to carry on doing the things that he'd been abusing them till until then. If you read further forward in the Bible, in Ezekiel, you'll find that they weren't very kind to widows, orphans or the poor either. And when you read in the Gospels, Jesus describes them as a faithless nation, a faithless people whose fortunes were always uh, a bit sketchy when it came to God. So God has got his mind uh, set about what to do uh, about Sodom. And Abraham realises that he's going to have to intervene here. He's going to have to say something because Lot is amongst all of this. His, his nephew, Lot, could get involved. And so we read that Abraham starts to pray. But actually, Abraham was already invited by God's inter, inven, invitation. Shall I in, let him know what I'm doing? God creates space in which Abraham can pray and discover a little bit about what he's planning to do. 
And so Abraham takes what he's learned about God into this situation, in his own situation, and starts applying it in his thinking about other people. Lot's household is, is just 10 people in this city. Abraham needs to think about how am I going to pray in an effective way? How am I going to appeal to God uh, to help these people out, even though I know that city isn't a good place? Abraham starts with this idea of 50. 50 doesn't sound like many to us, but given the size of the city was probably only 100 or so, 50 is probably half the population. Why would he, why would a just God kill half the population for the sake, you know, for the whole population for the sake of half that were bad? It makes us ask some questions. But Abraham appeals on the grounds of God's nature to be merciful. Far be it from you to do such a thing. Abraham has experienced loads of God's mercy. And it's God's mercy that encourages him to ask God to be merciful to others. And when we pray, we pray to someone who not only knows us and the way we express ourselves. See how much my hands are moving. I don't normally do that, I'm sure. But he also knows how we know him. He also knows deep down how we have experienced God's goodness and God's life in our own lives. And that becomes important in how we pray and how we intercede. If you've known great forgiveness, you will become somebody who prays about forgiveness for people. If you've known healing, you will, you will pray more passionately about healing for people. So we start from that place, don't we? If we want to learn to pay, pray passionately, we start from that place where we know God most deeply, our experience of him, because it shapes our relationship and understanding of him. It's our starting point. Abraham is passionate about rescuing Lot. He's already done it in battle. Now he needs God to intervene. But he's using this language within his prayer. He's using the language of God's righteousness and justice, appealing to those parts of his character in order to save Lot and his family. But watch also how God's language changes through the discussion. He moves from a position of, if I find I will spare the whole city, which is a good starting point, to then I will not destroy it for the sake of. In those few verses, in those four or five examples, God's language becomes clear. You can start off here, but there's a goal at the end. I will be doing something to this city. They have offended. And that's quite hard. But every day we pray, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've got to be serious about that. We ally ourselves into God's will and how this shapes the church, how our current situation shapes the, the country, the church, our people, our community, our family is part of his overriding will for us all. So it's important to hold on to those things. And then we find that Abraham stops. Perhaps it's that last warning. I will not destroy it for the sake of. But you and I both know. Occasionally, just occasionally, when I'm praying for something, I hear a small voice that says, I've heard you. And it's at that point I hand it over to God and say, you know what, it's in your hands now and I thank you for listening to me. I think that's been wonderful. But it's your business. It's your stuff. I, I, I'm at peace because I've been able to talk to you about it and I trust you because will you not do the right thing? And that's the starting point and that's the end point isn't it god will always do the right thing it won't always look like it for our point of view but if we want to pray passionately we bring into those things bring into god's will bring his mind his heart bring to those things uh, our attention to details things that are concern us because he is concerned for us as he is for others and his mercy to us can be extended to others I hope that's been helpful. I'll send some notes around for house groups to um, play around with. But I do wonder, are, are we able to pray? I wonder how rich our prayer life is. I wonder how uh, keen we are to see things happen. I wonder how thankful we are for our own protection and whether we can ask God to see more uh, than we do at the moment. Grace and peace to you. Amen.